I'm, I'm Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. I'm Gig. Hey. Good to meet you, virtually. Hey, not, not a problem. I was looking forward to uh, this interview all week because, uh, I don't know, it's, I think it's the, the nostalgia of Nintendo and just just wanting to be part, part of this. <laughs> I mean, hey, man, if you live on the planet Earth and you don't have a, a soft place in your heart for Nintendo, then, then uh, I'm not sure you're human. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what's actually amazing is that uh, my first Nintendo is actually the Wii. So I don't even know why I'm so excited <laughs> for something. Wow. Like well, it's such a culture. It's just such a part of our culture. I mean, for me anyway, at least, um, you know, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. So, I mean, you know, I grew up on, on Atari and television and then the original NES. Um, so, I mean, not even hearing, but just seeing visuals of those things just really... You know, the nostalgia for me just is at an 11. <laughs> no, I, I, I completely agree because uh, because I grew up with the Atari and Commodore 64. And I want to right. see, the, then, then after that, the next console I ever got was just the PlayStation 2. And I think it was just for the DVD player. <laughs> hey, you know what? So that's, that's part of what made the PS2. The, to, I mean, even to this day, it is the most... But, successful console of all time unless not unless there's like new data but yeah the ps2 is that dvd player man they got it right with that thing they they, they sure did now um for you jeremy how were you brought on board in onto this ambitious project in the first place because this this documentary series is just phenomenal oh well thank you first of all i really appreciate that um as a creator, as a filmmaker, I mean, any, I never want to gloss over that. Anyone, somebody says, I like what you, what you've done, what you've created. Um, I, uh, I like to stop and just acknowledge that. So thank you. Um, for me, it was, uh, you know, I'm an independent filmmaker, so I've, I've, I've never really had an established long-term relationship with a network or studio. Um, my, my production company, Media Juice, we, for the better part of coming up on 17 years, um, produce video game trailers. Mm -hmm. So I started in that back in 2004. Our first client was Atari. Um, this is sort of the like Atari 2.0 when they were reinvented three different times. And then they started doing PlayStation and Xbox. And uh, we started doing trailers for, for them for uh, Dragon Ball Z. And I think we did the trailer for the original Matrix video game on PS2. Um, so anyway, not to get my whole history, but but fast forward 15 years of doing video game trailers and video game documentary content, I uh, I basically just you know had a conversation with uh, my friend and executive producer Sean Aston, and he was like, "What do you want to do next? Are you going to keep doing you know more video games?" <laughs> and uh, I was like, man, there was just, I feel like with, you know, video games, the movie and then unlock. And then Sean and I did this little web series called what you don't know, which is just kind of like fun facts about video games. I was like, there's still, uh, there's just, there's a lot more to say um, about video game history. But if you're going to sort of like put the microscope on, on one subject matter or one company, um, it's it's not that it's the inevitable choice; it's the only choice. It's Nintendo. I mean, they've been around, as the documentary talks about, they've been around since the 1880s. And so, when I kind of made the decision, like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go back into this video game world. The 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 best dramatic. I mean, just for the sheer drama of it. The, the highs and lows of the company, it's like there's just, there's no other company that's been through what they've been through that's also attached to the video game industry um, like Nintendo. So just, uh, this is probably 2017, started uh, started kind of dreaming, like what could this look like? Let's, let's write some ideas that. I talked to Sean, let's write some, and it just evolved. That's amazing because you are talking about 140 years of history 
for Nintendo. Where do you even start on a project like this? Because it's so extensive. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the answer is exactly. Um, well, it actually started um, as a narrative, as, as a dramatic narrative. I was, I was writing uh, just a movie, you know, um, and because of the scope of it and because I'm an independent filmmaker, you know, I always look at, at things like if, if I'm going to write this, then I'm going to actually direct it too. I'm going to have to bring the resources to bear. And, you know, like I said, not really had a, a uh, established relationship with a network or studio that we know it's going to have a home. We know we have to sort of do the field of dreams. You know, if you build it, they will come. Um, they being the distributors. Um, but after a couple of months of writing that script, I, uh, I just realized it's too ambitious. It's, it's like, I, that's, that's a multi, multi, multi million dollar project. Um, so I was like, okay, if we, if we can't do a dramatic narrative, what, what, can, what can we do? You know, animation or I thought, well, a documentary is a, a genre that I had some experience in. My team has some experience in. Um, so we, we kind of switched to documentary. And the first step was writing the script. Just, okay, let's, let's lay this out, um, knowing that we're probably going to have narration and that was probably a six month process of writing that script out, researching. I read, I mean, probably half a dozen books that, that, are, that are known books um, that cover Nintendo's history and other game companies. Um, and uh, then I think, I think once we got in the voiceover booth with Sean Aston and we laid down the voiceover, um, that really gave me and my team a sense of, of the bones. Okay, let's start editing some visuals on top of this narration. Okay, let's go shoot an interview with this person. Let's bring that back. Let's cut that up and see where it fits in the historical timeline. Yeah, um, yeah so that was, that was kind of where it started. Since you did so much uh, extensive research under this, and you mentioned you read a, you know, some of the books uh, for people who watch the documentary, if they want to continue to, re you know, read the books that you read, what, what are some of the books you definitely recommend? Oh, for sure. Um, so there's a book called Super Mario by author Jeff Ryan. It's a really fun read and, and it, it goes coast to coast on Nintendo's history, but also sort of weaves in the history of, of the video game industry. Um, and then um, there's a book called Game Over, which is by David Sheff. Um, and it's, uh, it talks a lot about Nintendo's history, but it, uh, Game Over specifically dives into uh, some of the drama, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, you know, Nintendo's, rise to power and then kind of their struggle with re you know reigniting the video game industry in the 80s and and retailers and developers like the friction that they had between those two groups because they were trying to protect quality but the retailers were, were just wanted more <laughs> more product and the developers weren't used to having to be beholden to this japanese company um so stuff like that um I'm trying to think here super mario Game over uh, console wars, actually, by uh, uh, my buddy uh, Blake Edwards, um, is uh, a great book specifically about the, the console war between Nintendo and Sega. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Illustrated History of Electronic Games, that's another really good one. And uh, High Score is, a, is another really, it's, a, it's a, like a coffee table book that thick. Wow. Um, by, by my buddy Russell Demaria. That's a really good book. As you can say, I could go on and on, but <laughs> <laughs> that that is that is definitely some extensive research. Um, so, how did you pitch this to Nintendo to uh, participate in your documentary? Because obviously, you have to use a lot of you know video footage from them, and you have to get them on on board for something like this. Well, it's a it's an interesting uh, question. Uh, so, 
Nintendo has, uh, you know, they participated in, in, in uh, both of my previous projects, Video Games the Movie and Unlocked. Um, and when I approached them, uh, Charlie at Nintendo uh, was over their corporate communications. Great guy. Um, you know, he's, uh, we've been uh, colleagues for almost 10 years now. Um, you know, the, the big uh, question really uh, at the end of the day is, is will NCL participate? Uh, this is not Nintendo of America, but uh, Nintendo Company Limited, in, Nintendo in Japan. Um, and historically, they have not. Um, I think there might be one like 20 minute made for TV, uh, Nippon TV in Japan. Uh, documentary where where NCL actually participated and they had you know like Shigeru Miyamoto and y Mr. Yamauchi on camera uh, but short of that they have not really participated in anything that's directly focused on them um, and, it, and it's I mean it's understandable it's kind of like you know people want to know how the sausage is made yeah. and that's their secret sauce and I think they know that and and the only way a show like this exists is for someone to sort of make it outside of their purview, you know, um, because inside of their purview is what well, just doesn't get made. Um, and so they, they've been aware the whole time of, you know, I've been in communication with, with uh, Nintendo of America, my contacts there, and they're aware of, of us, uh, you know, talking to all the Nintendo veterans, the ex Nintendo, you know, like Karen Kaplan used to be a VP of marketing and Ron Judy used to, you know, was there in the early days of Nintendo of America, Howard Phillips, uh, and on and on. Um, but, uh, you know, they're aware that we're sort of embracing the editorial approach, which is, uh, you know, n not too dissimilar to what a newspaper reporter, you know, from, you know, Wall Street Journal or New York Times would, would, write a story uh, about a subject matter and they have to kind of uh, maintain editorial separation so that they can tell the story with uh, editorial integrity, I guess, uh, you know, yeah. and accuracy. And so that's what we've done here. And in those cases where we have to show visuals of, of a Nintendo, uh, you know, product or game or console, um, in, a, in a lot of cases, that's, you know, a fair use doctrine where we try to use as, as little as possible to get the point across. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's kind of the, uh, uh, you know, w what a lot of filmmakers have had to rely on when, when you're talking about someone that, you know, it's not a partnership. It's a, uh, it's more of like a news piece. You just have to use what you can to get, to get the visuals, visuals across, which actually is what led to some of the miniatures that you see in the show. Um, we were looking for ways to like, okay, how do we, how do we create visuals here that tell the story without overusing archival or overusing fair use? Um, and that's where that kind of came from was like, well, let's, what if we built little miniatures and we filmed those? And so. I was going to ask about the miniatures because I noticed it was used extensively in the first, I want to say the first, two parts of your documentary, but later on, it was almost nearly abandoned. Is it, is it just because there were more video footages available later? Yeah, it's, it's it, you know, you, exactly. It's, uh, you know, the, the early days of Nintendo, but a lot of that imagery just doesn't exist. You know, the first building of Nintendo, uh, there's no archival footage of that, save, you know, literally one image, which is what we use to base the models on. Um, same with a lot of the, you know, some of those early uh, like radar scope cabinets in the in the uh, uh, in the warehouse, and you know the infamous meeting with Toys R Us and Nintendo bringing in the NES. But as you get into uh, kind of 16-bit and beyond, you know, Super Nintendo and and uh, in 64, it uh, it actually yes, there was more video footage, but it was it was a specific choice that it felt it didn't feel as organic to use it as as we got more into the next generation and the next next generation it felt um story-wise it felt right to use footage there as mm -hmm. technology was progressing as, a, as opposed to relying on the miniatures 
How did you uh, manage to convince a lot of these interview subjects to participate? I mean, obviously, nostalgia probably was an easy sell, but were there were there people that you had to do a little bit of convincing? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, what's helped me and what's helped the project is, uh, you know, Media Juice, my uh, production company, um, has, like I said, been around for uh, coming up on 17 years and working primarily in the, the video game industry for video game publishers and developers. Um, we ventured out, in, you know, in the last six or seven years where we do a lot of work for film and television as well, like Prime Video. And um, so I think there's legitimacy there. When, when, when I or my company makes the request of someone, it's, uh, it's not necessarily just, a, just an independent filmmaker making the request. Um, but even with that legitimacy, um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> what, what are you doing here, Jeremy? Why, why Nintendo and why me? Um, and it, it, it usually was just a, you know, having an honest conversation, you know, like Perrin Kaplan, I mentioned before, um, uh, Perrin has really not done this at all. I think she's only done it for one other company. But uh, I've known Perrin for years, and uh, uh, she's, you know, just not seen the value of it. But I think when, when I told her what I was doing and that I was wanting to bring a lot of uh, loving care to it, like this is not an expose on Nintendo. This is a, an honest um, telling of, of the company. And, you know, I kind of gave her my word on that. Um, she said, okay. And, and that was the case with every one of them, just talking to that person, kind of setting them at ease, like, hey, this is, this, I love I love the company. I want to tell their story. I mean, yes, there's there were ups and downs and, and drama, and we're going to cover that in the, in the most uh, authentic editorial way we can. And you're, and by the way, you're part of that story. Like, and I would tell, you know, like Ron Judy, I just said, hey, there's, there's no one that can tell you're part of this story because you're such a big part of you know, bringing radar scope and, and turning that, transferring to Donkey Kong, which was, was the success of, the first success, success of the company. So, yeah, it wasn't easy, but I'm glad we got, you know, everyone we got. Was a, a lot of the other foot, the third party footages, were they also fair use or do you actually have to hunt, hunt them down too, especially like news reports and stuff? Um, yeah, we use... We use fair use only when absolutely necessary. Um, we had, uh, gosh, a, about a half a dozen or so uh, broadcast and cable partners that we would source footage from. So people like CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, uh, Getty, um, where we would go to them and say, hey, um, we're looking for footage you know, of, of these things, you know, of, the, of Super Nintendo at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1995 or of the N64 demo or interviews with Nintendo people at these press events. And, and we just kind of spread that net out to all those folks. And it was pretty awesome. Like when we started getting, you know, they call them screeners. Um, so we'd submit our requests, say, to like CNN. And then we'd, we'd just sit there and kind of kind of wait. Like, okay, what are we going to get back? It's like, it's like, it's like fishing. And then we'd, you know, we'd get a batch of like, you know, 15 links. We're like, okay, let's download all these. And it was like unearthing um, these little treasure troves of, of foot, literally in some cases, footage that had never even been digitized. Mm -hmm. It lived on like digibeta tapes and were, was just in their vault because no one had ever, you know, requested this footage. And so we had have to sometimes wait like, you know, two, three weeks, because they'd have to get it out of the vault, digitize it, send us a link. Um, so it was really cool to, to go through all that stuff and pick, you know, sort of sliver out the pieces that were relevant to the story. For, for you personally, Jeremy, what is your nostalgic moment? Because obviously you must have been excited to cover something of Nintendo that just, that just touched your heart. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm definitely a uh, an NES kid. You know, I was I was that kid in 1986 at, at Christmas that opened up opened up a present that was the uh, was the NES. Um, 
you know, I, don't, I think we had, I think Super Mario was the only game we had. We, we, pl- we tried to play Gyromite. That was really hard. <laughs> I don't know if we ever got it working properly. Uh, it's like Rob, Rob the robot was really cool looking, but making him actually work was a whole different proposition. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that, you know, there was probably a good five year period of, of my childhood that was just, I mean, that, that NES was in my room and I played all the classics, you know, Super Mario Brothers, Mike Tyson's Punch Out, Excite Bike, Akari Warriors, um, lots of playing with power magazines. Um, yeah, that's, uh, and then it was just gone on from there, but that's definitely the, the white hot center of nostalgia for me, Nintendo, it would be the, the 8-bit NES. Well, I, I'll admit, I binged through all five parts of your documentary, all in, all in one sitting. But a lot of people are going to be asking is, uh, what, what was it originally a five-part documentary, or did you basically put no limits, or did you even try to make it into like a, you know, like a 90-minute movie? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question, because like I mentioned before, it's like I'd started in the writing phase with it being a dramatic narrative, being just an actual movie. And uh, when I transitioned from that, um, yeah, we, we were just going to make one, just a feature, try to try to make it 90, 120 minutes max. And as we got into it, we started to realize, like when we were trying to trim it down, we're like, okay, for us to get this down to feature length, it's not, it's not trimming. It's like taking out entire sections of the story. And I think it was right it was right about when, uh, you know, when COVID had started to kind of hit last February, February 2020, where we kind of sat down as a team and, and made that decision. We're like, okay, do we want to sort of tell kind of a 30,000 foot, you know, maybe a little, a little bit shallower view of, of this company? Um, or do we really want to just dig our heels in and take the time? And, and, and we decided, okay, we're going to, we're going to make a docu-series. We didn't know if it was going to be three episodes or eight episodes or five. It kind of organically like whittled its way down to, to, to being five. Um, and we did all, like most of the post-production we did from home. Cause like, like I said, COVID had hit and I want to say two or three weeks after the decision to make it a docu-series, we were all, we had to, do a lot of work to get our media server up online where we could connect to it virtually and all the editing rigs for, for six different editors. Um, so yeah, it was a challenge. <laughs> well, let, let me leave with uh, one, one more thought here is uh, since all of this is over, because after people watch, watch this, they'll be, they'll realize how much work you actually put into a, uh, this this film, which I felt like it's 140 year in the making, but <laughs> yeah, what 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 are you up 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 for next, or or you're just going to take a extended vacation after all this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've still got my day job, thankfully, here at Media Juice. Um, I uh, if you go to MediaJuice.com, you can see our our production company there. We we do we're doing client work all the time. And uh, I'm, I'm the founder of Media Juice, but I'm also just day to day, I'm the creative director here. So uh, still doing that day in and day out. Um, as far as what's next creatively, it's funny because I, I, we just had Sean Astin um, on, on our podcast, on the Media Juice podcast, um, which will be coming out later this week. And, and we were talking about this very thing. And uh, Sean and I have a handful of projects that we're kind of tinkering on. We're always like collaborating and trying to come up with ideas for, for stuff like the, the what you don't know series we did just a fun little web series. Um, but th- that's the long answer. The short answer is, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely going to take a breath and uh, we'll see what happens next. <laughs> that's terrific. Hey, you know what? Thank you all for speaking with me. And, and I'm just curious, just for shits and giggles. Do you play video games with Sean Astin? We have, we have, you know, I think at uh, two different E3s, he's, he's come along with me. I've put him in my bag to go to E3 and uh, we'll go over to where they've got all the like 
classic games. They've always got that one section with the video game museum. And we've played, we've played some Atari and some Intellivision. uh, Sean's, Sean is an Intellivision kid. I was an an Atari kid before Nintendo. So that's always our little, little battle is like, which one was better? That is terrific. You know, it's, it's pretty funny is because I just got my, the the new uh, the new Atari system that they they did, they're relaunching this month. Oh yeah! So uh, so I just got mine in, and then and then I, I played it for like maybe like twenty minutes, and I was going, yeah. Now now, now I remember why most of us don't play this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's great in your mind, but in actual pra- practical application, it's like Atari. Yeah, it's it's uh maybe better left in our memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, Jeremy, hey, thank you for uh, speaking with us. I I highly recommend this documentary to anyone. Um, it, it is, you know what, it, it is so enthralling the way how you wrote the story and the historical nature of it. It, it, it is great for any Nintendo fan. Well, I appreciate that. That, that It means a lot. That's high praise. And I, I uh, just hope that, uh, you know, as a filmmaker, you, you go out and you, you, you're, 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 you're digging, digging ditches, you know, trying to, to push something up the hill. And uh, I do think uh, that uh, we've made something that I'm proud of and that I know Sean's proud of. So uh, I appreciate you watching it. And hopefully your, your listeners, your, your viewers um, will check it out. Leave, leave a comment. <laughs> Absolutely. They will. Well, thank you very much. Next time, Jim. Thanks, Gig. Appreciate Thank it. You.